not too many years ago, it was still that way. I want to study with you a subject that I have entitled, If the Foundations Are Destroyed, What Can the Righteous Do? Now, from the book of Psalms, the 11th Psalm, and in verses 1 through 7, please read with me. In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Or look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. And if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked, upon <coughs> the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. I want to look at the foundation we'll be discussing through this morning and evening sermon as well. There are four foundations that God has set in order in order that man might have the peace and tranquility as he lives upon this earth. They are very vital for man's existence and for his eternal happiness here and in life to come. The first one we're going to look at is that of the home. And we're going to look at society in general, and we'll look at civil government, and finally we'll be looking at the church. I want to review, I want to review with you in your mind, and you'll be able to see some of this, and I'm going to present the evidence that we will, are all aware of. The evidence of those foundations being destroyed. Now, you can't destroy the foundation of the church. Jesus is the foundation of that church. And the book says that on no other foundation can man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. But the other foundations are being destroyed. And to a great extent, some of them are almost totally, uh, have, have almost totally happened. What can the righteous do, though, is the question. If we look at the first two, then tonight, at the conclusion of our lesson, I'll give you the answer for that. As we look at the home to begin with, and we see it, it just isn't even a thing like it was when I was a young man, and, and I look back even 10, 15, 20 years ago, and it's changed drastically. But the thing that's caused the foundation that God has laid here to fail and to be uh, to crumble is the failure of each member of that family fulfilling their God-given roles and responsibility in the home. The husband, our father, and first of all, as the head of the family. In the book of Ephesians, and we're going to be appealing to Scripture in everything we have to say, in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, the book says, While the husband is the head of the wife, even as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. He's to be an instructor and a spiritual leader of his children. In Ephesians 6 and verse 4, the book says, Father, do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition or training and admonition of the Lord. He's to be an example for his family in influence. Now while uh, the following verse that we're going to look at is applicable to elders, it's, uh, if the principle is applicable to every father that there is. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5, the record says of the qualifications of an elder, He's, one, he's to be one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? In this we see the wisdom of God shown in that man 
in a family relationship is able to, uh, to settle problems and to raise his children in such a way, not that they will uh, become Christian because he said so or because he's an elder, but because they see his godly example that he lives in front of them and they desire to be like him and thus obey the gospel and follow in his footsteps. In many homes, the role of the father and husband has been surrendered, and we'll talk more about that as we go on. But the wife is to be in subjection. That's the teaching of the Scriptures. In Ephesians 5 and verse 24, the record says, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, there, are, there is a, an attitude today among some younger women especially that they don't want their husband having the rule over them. I was asked on one occasion to perform a marriage ceremony between a young woman and, and her, and her uh, fiancé, and uh, I agreed to do so. She said, just one thing, Brother Holmes, I don't want the words love and obey in the ceremony. I said, then get you somebody else. Because the book says that the wife is to obey her husband and everything. Now, he's not to be a tyrant. He's not to be a dictator. The, the bottom line is, though, that she is to learn, just as the church is subject to, to Jesus, the wife is to be subject to her husband in everything that they might follow in the example that God has given. She's to be a homemaker and an instructor of the children. It's in today's society which we live where children become Let's keep children, as they're sometimes called. Those children don't get the motherly direction that they ought to be receiving. They're, they're not raised many times. They're just jerked up by the hair of their head, so to speak. They're not taught principles that they need to have been taught. And they have not a mother that's a godly woman, but rather one that is trying to, to uh, keep up with the times and the styles and she's more interested in her office job or her job or her life in the public eyes than she is before her children. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 14, <coughs> the book says, Therefore I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. There are many homes that I see almost every day in my life. Many of them among those who profess to be Christians. Where the wife and mother is not as she ought to be, and the community knows that as well as, as everybody else, and they speak reproachfully regarding that, that which is true from God. <coughs> it is done because of the fact that her life is not as it ought to be and does not shine as an example of what God wants her to be. In the book of Titus, chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5, speaking of the wives and mothers, that they admonish, that is, the older women are to admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children. Now listen to them. To be discreet, to be chaste, that's not C-H-A-S-E-D, incidentally. That's C-H-A-S-T-E. That means godly, holy, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Very similar to the, uh, the, the reproach that the adversary does toward the truth of God. Women, young women, need to, you young women in the audience that, uh, one day we'll be getting married. If you're uh, not already going with someone now, you will in time to come. Now think about this. This is your God-given role when you become married. You're to be an obedient wife. You're to be one who's in, in submission, not to a dictator. And I'll have time, perhaps sometime in this series, to talk to the men. But a man is to love his wife. Now I'll just stop here and make a brief observation. The book says in Ephesians 5 that husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Comes on down a couple of verses later and says uh, that, uh, that uh, you are to love your own 
Why, how do you love your wife as you love your own body? No man ever yet hated his own body, but loves it and cherishes it, even as the Lord of the church. Now, husband, do you love your wife like you love your own body? Do you love her and cherish her as you ought to do? And incidentally, the word cherish there means to keep warm, much like a hen. In fact, the Hebrew language describes it like a mother hen that keeps her young chicks warm. You ever been on a farm and see, see a, a, an old hen when a thunderstorm comes up or it gets cold, gather those chickens under her wings and protect them from the rain, from the storm, and keep them warm? That's the way husbands are to do to their wives. How often do you tell your wife you love her? When's the last time that you told her that you loved her and showed her even more so that you loved her? This is the way God intends for it to be. We're talking about God's foundation that He's placed for the home, and we're going to be looking at how it has crumbled, and it's not today like it was at one time. In the book of Proverbs, regarding the father being the instructor and listening and, and teaching his children, in Proverbs chapter 31 and verses 26 through 28, here he talks about the mother and how she is to be towards her children. Now, if anyone ever said, anyone ever had the idea what it's the father that's supposed to do all the teaching, look at this verse from the wisest man that ever lived, claimed to be at least, as he describes a mother, a godly mother, when he says, she opens her mouth with wisdom. You young people, when your mother opens her mouth and speaks to you and directs your life and encourages you to do certain things, and it, perhaps the way you're dressing, the way you're talking, the places you go, she's speaking with words of wisdom that God has given her from His book. And He says, She opens her mouth with it, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. And she is kind to you when she tells you about things that you don't want to hear. Those are things that she's trying to make you into a, a fine young lady and a fine young mother and, and wife one day. She watches over the ways of her household, does not eat the bread of idleness, and her children rise up and call her blessed. You, you young people out there, do you look upon your mother as one who is a blessed woman? I'm going to tell you something. One of these days, if you don't now, you will, and perhaps it'll be too late then. But your mother is given to you as a gift from God. A gift from God to help you in your life to, be, to become and to be the kind of wife and mother that God intends for you to be. Children are to be students of their parents. And in particular, now we're going to be looking at what I was uh, fixing to get off into a moment ago regarding a father's instruction to his children. Look with me at Proverbs again. You know, let me pause here just a moment. Drive down a little bit here. The book of Proverbs is a book where, if you'll pardon the expression, where the rubber meets the road. It's about life. It's about how to direct our lives. It's about how to keep us from the evil way and help us to be right with God. It'll keep you, listen to me, it'll keep you out of trouble, young people. It'll keep you out of jail. It'll keep you out of a relationship that you would to God you'd never gotten into. It'll help you live longer years in your life because you followed your father's instruction. Now read with me. My son, or you can put daughter in there. It's just as well. If you receive my words and treasure my command within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, understanding, and lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver, that is wisdom, as silver, and search for her as hidden treasure, then you will understand. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of His saints. Then, it will be then that you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. If you'll just listen to your mother and father. He goes on to say in the third chapter of Proverbs, beginning at verse 1 and through verse 13. 
My son or daughter, do not forget my law. Let your heart keep my commands. Now listen to him. For length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you what I just told you a while ago. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck and write them on a tablet of your heart. And so, if you do this, find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh, strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possession, with all your possessions, with the first fruits of all your increase, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. Young people that I have seen across this country that applied these principles to their lives from their parents grew up to become good citizens, faithful children of God, good mothers and good fathers, and a better and place a better society for us in which we live because they followed the directions of their parents themselves. We look at the evidence of destruction of, of the home and we see it many times brought on by dominating wives and weak men. We've got a lot of jokes that fly around and float around the, the country and, and people tell them and they just laugh about it. You know, well, my wife's a, I'm the head of the house, but my wife's the neck that turns the head. Now, that may sound funny, but it's not really funny. God has placed the husband, the father, to be the head of the home. Now, there's a reason for that. The reason is that God has, has not only placed this individual there, it's not an easy place to be, I'll tell you that, but he's, he's, he's to be one who has uh, the energy to get out and work and provide a living, he has the experience of life itself and he knows how the, what the dangers are to their children and knows how to raise them, knows how to be, knows how to be over the head, the head over the family. My wife, when this ladies, uh, women's lib movement first came out, I overheard her telling another woman one night, she said, you know, they can have what they want to, but I'm glad that I, don't, that I'm a, I have a husband that's the head of the house. I would hate to be the one that had to make final decisions. That's right. And as a father and as a husband, we are able to discern evils that children and wives are not able to discern, usually as a whole. I have on occasion been ashamed to be of the male species because I was able to hear the comments of so many men of the male species as they bragged about the number of people, of, of girls and women that they had laid claim to and conquered in their lives sexually. It's not something that, it's like, like the Indian that gathers scouts on his, on, his, uh, on his spear. Just how many people that they can conquer. That's not the way it is. The fathers are able to have that wisdom and, and take care and protect their children. How many, how many times, you young people, how many times has your father perhaps told you, no, I don't want you to go up with that boy? Let me tell you something. Your father just may know something about that boy you don't know. And it might be that he's trying to protect you. I remember on one occasion, my, our daughter was in high school, 12th grade, and she told me about a young boy that had, she said, Daddy, I, I, he, he, he's on me all the time, all the time, just ragging on me and trying to get me to go out with him and he's, a, he's not a nice boy at all. And uh, he had called her a couple of times and I'd ask phone, give him to Diane. She said, I said, well, what's his name? She told me and I said, I'll answer the phone next time you call. So she called, he, a day or two later, the phone rang and she answered it and she just nodded to me and I picked the phone up. 
I said, young man, this is Diane's father. Don't you ever call over this house again. You better leave my daughter alone. If you don't, you're going to wish that you had it. He said, I'm not afraid of you, old man. I said, I'll tell you what, you come home. And we'll see whether you're afraid of it or not. I'll be there. I'll be there. I said, all right. I'll be sitting here waiting. I sat there in the living room with a great pullback until about 2 o'clock in the morning. He never showed up. And I'll tell you, that's what fathers are for. Fathers are to protect their children and their wives and to, and to protect their family. That's why God has placed them there. But there are weak men. There are weak men. I remember Wilson Coon telling me one time about going to a tri- place to try out for preaching. Wilson had a, uh, a way of uh, talking about uh, uh, to a woman uh, that wasn't very faithful, and he would say, "Sister." And anyway, he went home with his family. And he was a, he, he, one of the elders, and he had a farm, and they had a big scrumptious meal. And his wife wasn't able to go with him, and but he sat there and. And after he got to eat, while well, the elder screwed him, just said, I got to go down and check on some cows. And uh, as soon as he left, got through the door, while the wife said, Brother, Brother Coon, how much do we have to pay you to come work for us? And he said, Well, sister, you don't have to pay me a dime. She said, We what? He said, I come and preach for nothing. Well, how can you do that? He said, All I'll ask you to do is just. Move my family and myself, my family down here in a house, put us in a house where you want to be seen living. And you just put me in the kind of car you want me to see me driving around visiting with. And you put the kind of clothes on me you want me to be seen wearing as your preacher. And my family dress them in the same kind of clothes that you wouldn't want to be ashamed of them being my, my family and my and your preacher's family. And just put the same kind of food on my table that you've got on your table. And she said, "Well, wow, we couldn't do that. He said, Sister, let me tell you something. I wouldn't come for any amount of money. I know you're just a she elder. And, and your husband left so you could, in, uh, that you could put me through an imposition. And he said, no, I'm not interested. Well, this is the kind of people I'm talking about. There are a lot of she elders in the church. A lot of women, wives, a preacher, or elders' wives, that want to run things. Now, there's nothing wrong with an elder considering his wife and talking with his wife about things. In fact, they ought to. I'll tell you what, Joanne has come up with some better ideas than what I had on occasion in matter of decision. But the bottom line, the, 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 man, the husband is the, is the one to make the final decision. It's like the old saying, the buck stops here. There are young people that reject the guidance of parents and sometimes in the physical way. I counseled with a family one time. I, I studied, started off studying with them and baptized a couple of the, the, the uh, boys. They had uh, four boys, I believe it was, and one daughter. All but the younger boy was, uh, uh, were grown. And I come to find out that uh, those boys beat their parents on occasion. Now, I'm talking, you hear, you heard me right. They beat their parents on occasion. And the father told me about one occasion that one of the sons chased him up the street trying to catch him to whip him. Now, I don't know about uh, this man and his children, but I know about my family and the kind of kind of relationship that we have in my own personal life and in my own life as a child being raised. My children respected me to start with. They would never have raised a hand to me in any way, form, or fashion, because, not because they were so afraid of me, but because they loved me and respected me. Oh, they knew what they'd get if they did wrong. I remember running from my father on one occasion as a young boy, uh, round and round the house, and I ran until uh, he, he finally stopped. And I said, uh, I'll, I'll come back here on with me. He did say a word. He went in the house. And I crawled underneath the house. The old house was up off the ground about that far. And I crawled where... He went in the house and sat down in the rocking chair and I could see the old boy just back and forth. And I crawled underneath there and I said, Daddy? Yes. Daddy? I'll come out if you won't whip me. All he'd say was, Son, the longer you stay under there, the harder I'm going to whip you. And I said, No, I said, Daddy, please, please, I won't ever run from you again. Son, the longer you stay, the harder I'm going to whip you. Now, I stayed there until I knew I couldn't stand any more whipping. <laughs> and I come and caught him out. And he proved his fault. And I never ran again. <laughs> Someone asked me one time, I talked I talk about being obedient to my, my father and my parents. 
I said, I never slashed my father in me. And all of my life, I never slashed him once. He said, well, how the can you be sure? That's been so long ago. I said, I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Parents need to train their children in such a way that they need to be strong with them. need to be a father that's respected and honored and need to be strong enough in their life to be an example of, of appreciation to those children and that those children follow them as they ought to do. Question that then we come down to, brethren and folks, is why do these things happen? They happen because of the fact there's been a breakdown in both word and in deed in the home. The, the, the father is not what he ought to be, the husband is not what he ought to be. Just a meat, uh, milk coat individual that's yes ma'am and this all, all the time. I honor my wife. I love her more than any creature on this earth. She's my mate. She's my best friend. But I, I love her because of who she is and what she is. She loves me in the same way. You know, there's a there are women in this world. I read this an, an article not too awful long ago. Because there are, more, there are more and more women in this world that are uh, adorning the idea, if you if I might use that term, that I don't want a man. I want I, I don't I don't want a husband. I don't want to be bothered with a husband. I talked to a woman one time that lost her husband. She said. I, I'll never marry I don't want another man that I got a fool with. Well, I, that's, that's her choice. She didn't have to do that. But I read of a woman one time, a single woman. She was you know, about 25, 30 years of age. And she was raiding against men. She's raiding against marriage. Why? She wasn't lesbian. She was raiding against marriage. She said, I don't want a, I want a family. I want children, but I don't want a man. And so she sought out what we have here artificial insemination to get pregnant so she could have children. Now, that's, that happens all the time today. I'm not talking about now a, a woman that, that can't get pregnant by her husband. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about uh, the husband not able to produce a seed. I'm talking about women that don't want a husband. This kind of outlook on life is nothing in the world and the significance of it is simply a, an attempt to circumvent God's arrangement for the home. Because you see, God's arrangement for the home is found in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8, and verse 18. The Lord God said, it's not good. It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. I don't care if it's a man or a woman. God is talking here about the fact that it's not good for a man to, to live alone. It doesn't mean that it's a sin if he decides not to marry, that Paul did. Not a sin if the woman decides not to marry, as I thought the kingdom of heaven's sake, as, as many have done. He's talking about it's not good, and it's not good for this reason. Because of the fact that the book of God tells us clearly that God, the God who created us, created within, uh, within us as normal, as normal human beings, a, a desire for sexual satisfaction that only marriage can supply right in the sight of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, the old King James says, fornication, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. That's to avoid the temptation to become involved sexually where you shouldn't become involved. Our sexual appetite is the strongest appetite that's in the, in the world. It's much stronger than our appetite for food, and it will take us many times into sin that we don't want to go to. Let us look now for at society, and I'll have to hurry to get through with uh, with uh, with my lesson today. But I'm going to make it. You just stick with me. In our society today, I want you to follow with me now. From the very beginning of man's existence, God has given him a society to live in. And to listen to it, the quality, the quality of that society depends upon whether or not man is willing to be governed by God's standard for that society. That's the problem. Man don't want to be governed by, uh, by, by God in this. He wants to have a society, but he wants to live like he wants to live. And many times, they live like God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, beginning through verse 24, the Lord God called a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in, in the plate. Incidentally, this is the first surgery that you know of. God cut him open 
and took a rib out. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. God's standard. Talking about society's standard. God's standard is in society for marriage and that of a man to a woman. We got, we got some changes from that in our society today. But God's standard for society is marriage, one man, man for a woman, not man to woman, not man for man. His standard is one man for one woman for life with one exception. God never planned for divorce, though He allows it, tolerates it, for one reason, for, and remarry, that is remarried. But uh, uh, God's intention is that man have a companion. And woman have a companion. We, can, we need someone to talk to. We need someone to, to uh, lay our head on. We need someone to share our burdens with. That's what God meant when He said it's not good for man to be alone. Listen to me, folks, and young, pe young people especially. God's law. I say to you, said Jesus, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality or fornication and marries another commits adultery. Whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. When you marry, it is for life. It is for life if your husband dies. Romans 7 and verse 2. As long, she is bound by her husband as long as he lives. Bound by the law of her husband as long as he lives. But if he dies, she's free to marry somebody else. Now, the only exception to that is this right here. If, if the maid commits adultery, fornication, she can put him away, or, or he can put her away, whichever the case may be, and marry him. He don't have to marry, but he's talking here about remarriage. And some say, this is just talking about divorce. No, it's talking about divorce and remarriage. He said, except if, if you divorce your wife, except for fornication, and marry another, you commit adultery. Whoever marries her who's put away for fornication commits adultery as well. Over 50%, are you listening? Over 50% of marriages end in divorce today. And that ought to tell you something about selecting your mate. You think, well, that's not so bad, but I want you to consider something with me. This record, this, these statistics, 50% of marriages, are taken from the books of the courthouses for marriage license applications. Now, what is not considered is that many of these, many of these are the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth applications for marriages because they've been divorced that many times before. So when you look at it in a realistic way, divorce runs as high as 80% in our society. Your chance for survival in a marriage is going to depend upon one thing only. The respect that you and your mate have toward the Word of God. You're going to have problems. My wife and I, come January, will be married 59 years. It hasn't been an easy trip, but it's been one that's been filled with joy and pleasure. I told you earlier, there are times in my life that I don't even like Joanne, but I always love her. Sometimes she don't love, she don't like me, but she always loves me. I say that problems in marriage is is it, 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 all together temperamental. Listen. Marriage problems are temperamental. 95% temper and 5% mental. <laughs> and the reason that you have these situations is because people don't sit down and look at it from God's viewpoint and work out their problems as they ought to with a love and respect for the Word of God. When you do that, I don't care what happens, you'll stay together because you know that marriage is for life. The foundation for society has crumbled in these things. Homosexuality and lesbianism has not only become not only common, but now it's lawful. They are have passed laws in California and Oregon and Washington states and in Massachusetts and other places, and it will be so in Texas one of these days, if the Lord if the world stands and the and, and the Lord don't come again. That that same sex marriages, sodomy, lesbianism, Homosexuality will be 
accepted. You know what, very many years ago, that Texas had a anti-sodomy law? If two men were caught practicing sodomy, they could, they could be arrested and jailed. You may not know this, but only about four or five years ago, the Texas sodomy law was repealed by our state legislature. No longer is it against the law for two men to practice sodomy. It's a disgrace. Now you wonder, why, and now you're, you begin to understand what I mean when I say the foundations are crumbling. The foundations are crumbling. Same-sex marriages, sodomy, lawful in many states. God has spoken, but do any care. Look with me if you would, and I have, I have a young man tell me one time, you can't tell me, you can't show me, he said, and he was right, I couldn't show him because he wouldn't listen. You can't show me where the Bible condemns homosexuality. I said, well, just look in your Bible. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. And again, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's bring it over to the New Testament. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, will, nor revilers, will, or nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were, you see, the gospel has the power to convert. Some of these people at Corinth have been homosexual, they've been thieves, they've been adulterers, they've been all kinds of things. But he said, you were, some of you, that's past tense, but you were washed. They obeyed the gospel. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord, our, the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now you look at Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 16. You may not believe this, but I'm going to show you it's true. If a woman, listen to it, if a woman approaches any animal, can you imagine this? You have, to, you have to stretch your mind to do it. And mate with it. You shall kill the woman and the animal, they shall surely be put to death, their blood is upon thee. And what we're talking about, folks, is bestiality. It happened today just as it happened back then. It happened then. God said it did. That's why He gave this law. There were women that were mating with animals. And there are women that do the same thing today. I haven't seen it, don't want to see it, but I've been told, uh, i overheard conversations of men that have seen it. And they're in the slime pits of degradation. If a person had to go into hell and look for people like this, they'd have to surely go into the very cesspool and the very bottom of hell to find them. Along with the child molesters and the rest of them. And I'll tell you, these adults, video stores you see up and down the highway. They're, they're probably to, to, to contribute to this. Those with the with the XXXX video games that they have. And I'll tell you something. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. I want to show you where the foundation is coming. Hollywood has joined the race. You remember a few years ago when they came out with this movie Broke Back Mountain? Two cowboys Becoming sodomite, homosexual. <coughs> I'll tell you something, folks. I can't imagine John Wayne being a homosexual. <coughs> there were some of those people that were. They ought to take them out and hang them by the toenails. They ought to be called exactly what they are. They're sodomites. And I'm getting sick and tired of hearing their alternate lifestyle, bunch of bull. It's, it's, it's slime pit degradation down in the very bottom part of society. They are nothing in the world but slime lads. Someone told me one time, he said, I, I think, Brother Holmes, you hate you hate them. No, I don't. I'll tell you something, folks. I would welcome a whole building full of homosexuals out there this very hour if they were willing to listen to the truth. And I, I believe that if they would come and listen to what I have to offer from this book right here, I could convert them just like, just like some of those in Corinth were converted. Amen. 
No, I don't have I don't have any hatred for them. But I am sick and tired. This preacher is more than sick and tired of seeing the glo- seeing them glorified and 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 this uh, uh, bleeding hearts about all oh, soldiers they died and I went to Dallas one time downtown somewhere or other and they had had a homosexual uh, pride day and they were you know how they mark out a place where somebody murdered on the sidewalk they had all these these places marked off in people's names, homo's names that were died, that had died. Listen to me. I don't want to be misquoted. My heart goes out to every person that dies of AIDS that contracted it by a blood transfusion or something like that. But I have absolutely zilt, zero compassion for anyone that lives and dies a homosexual in their life AIDS because they brought it upon themselves. The book says they received their just amount of reward. They live that life and be not deceived. God is not mocked. He's not mocked at all in any way form or fashion. What they sow, they'll reap. God's standard is again in our society, marriage is for life. He never made provision for divorce. His standard is for society to live at peace with one another, home to be a place of refuge. You ought to be able to go home after a hard day's work where people have treated you like dirt. You can go home and you can have a wife or husband or, or children or parents that will understand and put their arm around you and help you to understand that life is bearable because they're going to help you there. Treating each other as you would have to be treated. How do we want to be treated with kindness and love and respect? Matthew 7, 12 said, Therefore, whatever you would you'd have men do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophet. And that passage that I looked at with you in a Bible class, look at it again. Think about this. And I'll tell you what, if this was applied in our lives, our marriages would be 100% more happier. Let all, listen to it. Ephesians 4, 31, 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and all evil speaking be put away from me with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. When you see, when you hear your children uh, treating each other in an unkind way, this would stop it. When you hear your parents treating each other in this kind of way, this would stop it. I think the greatest thing that a, that a young person could do, and they might end up getting a thrashing for it, but if they did, they'd be, they'd be justified in it, is to take their Bible and just present this to their parents when they hear them fussing like this and say, this is what Jesus says for you to do. For wife to a husband, a husband to a wife, it's reminding of this. It's God's order to help us to be what we ought to be. These are not just things for Christians to have in their lives, but for everybody. And society, in order for society to have an orderly life, otherwise anarchy will result. We see the foundation of society destroying, destroying in the home, destroying the home, and the results of the day I'm going to stop right there, because if I don't, I'll be a long time. And so I'm going to stop right there, and we'll take up right there again. I, I hate to stop, start in the middle of the point, but I think I can remember it. You come back tonight, and uh, like Paul Harvey says, now we'll have the rest of the story. I appreciate the presence of everyone. I, I truly do. You've given me undivided attention, and thank you for it. Now, just run your Bible. That's all I ask you to do. Run your Bibles and check what I have to say. Think about what we're talking about, folks. <coughs> this world <coughs> is in a bad shape. Our life today is in a bad shape. This country is in a bad shape. You know why it's in a bad shape? Because man has lost respect for God and His Word. Now, where can that start? I'll just give you a little hint. You look in the mirror, you'll find answers. You look in the mirror, you'll find answers. It starts able or not. We'll talk more about that tonight. But if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I want you to think about where you are and what you are. Let me just say this in closing. Jesus came to this low ground of sorrow. When the world he came to, listen, folks, it wasn't better than what we live in today. It was worse. No, not worse. It was as bad. 
it's getting worse all the time. In fact, I know it's going to continue to get worse for the Bible says it is. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse. Worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So it's not going to get better. But look back. Jesus lived and died during the day when the Romans were known homosexual. Nero was one of the greatest homosexuals that ever was known in history. Ungodliness on every hand. Immorality, cheating, crookedness in politics. He came, though, in the midst of all this to die for you and I. To save us from this kind of world. I, if I had the opportunity of living forever in, in this world, no, I wouldn't do it. I don't want to live forever in this world. Thank God that Jesus came, suffered on the cross, died the most horrible death any man could die. Any man could die. And he did it so you and I could be saved. When all was said and done, right before he went back to heaven with the Father, he gave his, he gave his disciples some instructions. You'll find this recorded in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. When he said, go into all the world, he's talking to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. He that believeth the gospel, that is, and is baptized, shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned or damned. Now, it's up to you and I as to whether we accept this or not. Gospel means good news. And the gospel is the good news. The, this New Testament is the gospel of Christ. The good news is what Jesus did for you and I. He, he lived, he suffered, he died, was resurrected. In order that you and I can be resurrected one day as well. One of these mornings, one of these days, the clouds are going to roll back, folks. I don't have time to preach a sermon on the, the end of time and the second coming of Jesus. But very briefly, one of these days, there'll be clouds that'll be there. The Bible says so. And Jesus will be seen in the clouds. And there'll be a great trumpet sound. And the record says that all the graves will be opened. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, or verses uh, 27 and 28. All the graves will be opened. And shall come forth. The dead shall come forth. Those that have done good to the resurrection of life. Those that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Where are you going to be? Where are you going to be? Remember Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 15, and 16. Now, have you done that? Have you done that? If you haven't, you're going to be among those that are lost. Not because... The Church of Christ preacher said so. Not because somebody else says so. Not because it's what the Church of Christ believes. Because the Church of Christ don't believe anything. It just we just believe what the Bible says. We don't have a doctrine except the doctrine of Christ. What does? Where, where would you stand with God? Where would you stand with God if He were to come at this very moment in time? Would you be among the those that are that are of the righteous, or be among those that are of the unrighteous? book tells us in Revelation chapter 20 that hell and the grave talking about the Hadean world of the, of the paradise park where the thief went to and where the wicked are where the rich man went to they'll all come forth and those that done wicked will be cast into everlasting hell but the righteous will be carried into that celestial home of God called heaven don't you want to go to heaven don't you want to go to that beautiful place that Jesus has invited us to share his home with? You can. But you've got to become a Christian first. And then you have to live as a Christian until death. And the Lord will give you a crown of life. If you're here this morning and you're subject to heaven's invitation, we encourage you to let your request be made known and your decision to live for God. He'll forgive you and on his turn, whatever you need might be, would you not let your request be made known while together we stand and sing?